Everyone, welcome to the Cartel Web uh, Webinar Series uh, 10. This webinar is about designing, testing, verifying, and validating using the FOT and NDS data for improving vehicle automation. So I am Fabian Utesh and will uh, guide you as a moderator through this webinar about 60 minutes. Um, this webinar is part of the CUT initiative and webinar series. <clears throat> this is about um, effort to uh, by Cartra and Scout to um, unify European projects. There are about 30 partners and 40 associated partners from research industry and authorities. The go project goal is um, to bundle European actions and to accelerate the deployment of automated driving. And to present cut uh, projects and explore global issues in automated driving research. These activities split up uh, into different um, parts like this webinar. We also have an annual conference, the digital knowledge base, strategic guidance, stack a stakeholder workshop, um, data sharing and evaluation, and the position paper development. Um, the groups that are uh, interested and uh, which are covered in the series include, but are not limited to, uh, safety validation, um, human factors, and big data and AI. And AI. Um, I will uh, guide you through this uh, webinar. Um, we have then the first talk from Jan Sauerbier from the IK Aachen uh, about the usage. Whoa, why is it? going by itself, <laughs> sorry. Um, then uh, the second one by Peter Wagner from the DLR and the last one from Willy from the ICC, Willy Portuli by the ICCS. And I um, would like to have um, that the speakers have their time first, like 15 minutes of uh, speaking time and you can post your questions in the chat. We will collect them and um, I will uh, try to forward these questions after each talk to each um, speaker so that we all know what is still on our mind, what was just talked about. And um, if not all questions can be addressed, then we will um, forward them to the speakers by email so they may come back to you or add them to the slides if you then download the slides later. And afterwards, I will do a short wrapping up of the meeting. Okay, then, um, uh, I would start with um, giving the uh, presentation to Mr. Jan Sauerby here. He is currently working at the RWTH Aachen, which specializes in building the car of the future. This includes the areas of the chassis, body, powertrain, electrics and electronics, and driver systems with a focus on safety, energy efficiency, and driving experience. They work closely with the cross-domain areas of strategy and consulting, vehicle concepts, acoustics, thermal management, and vehicle system evaluation. He um, himself specializes in autonomous driving and has recently pub published on the impact of automation on everyday traffic. So without further ado, um, Jan, you are the moderator. Yes. Um, can you see it? my screen? Yeah, looks Perfect. good. Yeah, okay, then um, hello from my side uh, as well. Um, yeah, first of all, maybe also two sentences about me from my side. Uh, yes, my name is Jan Sauerbier. I'm employed um, at the Institute of Automotive Engineering, uh, as Fabian already said, at the University of Aachen, and also at the FKA Forschungsgesellschaft Aachen. This is the uh, little company very, very close connected to the Institute. And I'm working in the, especially in the German project called Pegasus, uh, so for uh, safety validation. Uh, and we, we deal very much uh, with the topic I'm uh, I'm talking about today how to use different data sources to make um, automated driving uh, yeah, safe. So the title, as you can see, is uh, Usage of FOT and NDS data as a reference for verification and validation methods. So to start the presentation, um, the first slide, as I mentioned before, um, the idea is to collect data from different data sources. 
uh, put them all together in one database, which you can see in the middle of the screen, uh, process them and generate a useful output for um, testing automated driving systems. Um, for this, we need especially FOT and NDS data uh, because they are quite natural. So we, we see the, the natural driving of, of people, um, but we also can process accident data or data from the test drives, the driving simulator or simulations. Um, the data in the database is then processed and uh, yeah, so-called logical scenarios uh, with a parameter space are generated in the format of open scenario. Um, yes, and we will see some slides about this um, later on. Uh, what you can see here is an over overview about the different data sources and the benefit we can get from it. Uh, for example, from uh, real driving, uh, real, <clears throat> real uh, traffic data, we can get a complete scenario description. Um, of course, just if the sensor setup is good enough. It means that we have, um, yeah, for example, full description of all the vehicles that are around the Ego vehicle. So we know where the vehicles are, how fast they are and so on. Um, we also get the scenario relevance out of the real traffic data because we know how often specific scenarios occur. Uh, the information about the scenario reference uh, in the last column, which means uh, the skills of human drivers um, is given. Yes, but limited because we just have the reference of one special driver and often we don't have information about the reasons why human driver behave like they do. Uh, on the other hand, for example, um, we do not get information about the scenario description and relevance if we use data from a proving ground, uh, also from a driving simulator, but instead we get detailed information about the scenario reference from those um, yeah, examples of data. Uh, this is now an overview about what is going on in the database. So after we collected all the data, um, we make some data checks and administration things. Um, afterwards, did use signals are calculated, for example, time to collision or the time headway. Uh, so this is extracted directly from the input data. Um, then a very important step, we determine the scenario affiliation. <clears throat> uh, so that means to, to, to look into the data and uh, yeah, check which, which special scenarios are in there. And then the next step is to merge all the different scenarios and determine the exposures. And then with this information, we can afterwards generate the logical scenarios with parameter spaces uh, in the format of open scenario. And then the people dealing with the test concept, test automation, test automation, and so on can go on working with that. Um, yeah, what you can see now is a visualization of what is going on in the database. So you see, um, yeah, a video of, of a drive, and then the data is going into the data uh, into the database. And uh, on the right side, you can see now how the database interprets uh, the data. Um, yeah, and the signal checks are okay. Mini um, the minimum, minimum requirements are okay and the format is also okay. So those are the checks at the, at the beginning. Yeah, and uh, what you can see now is the front end of the database where you can visualize the input data and the deduced uh, signals. Uh, this is a, uh, a short example video. So uh, you put in the, the input data and then you can see, for example, the speed um, of the Ego vehicle. Um, this is the blue line now at the moment and uh, the speed of the, of the car in front of me um, is shown in red now. So you can, you can check uh, if the data is correct and if you can use it and so on. And you can also uh, show the, the uh, time to collision, for example, or something like this. Um, on this slide now, um, the scenario affiliation is visualized. So you can see again the video that you have seen already before. On the right side is the top view video. You have seen this also before. But what is new now is at the bottom. Um, you can see the automatically identified scenarios. Um, 
I think it's not 100% synchronous to the video, but you can see the main maneuvers in the vehicle. So we already uh, saw a cut in and a cut out maneuver, the free driving and the following, which we are at the moment. And now, in a few seconds, uh, the cut out scenario begins again. And uh, yeah, it is cutting in again afterwards. Yeah, and the the algorithms in the database can detect those scenarios automatically. Yeah, the next slide um, is, is again an extract of the database front end um, where all the scenarios found in the data are listed. So here we had uh, two cattle maneuvers, two cut in maneuvers, three times following and two times free driving. Yes, after extracting the scenarios from the input data, we extract also the scenario parameters. Um, that means we extract parameters that we need to reproduce um, for the scenario later on in a simulation or on the test track. Uh, in this example um, of a cut-in maneuver, so which is uh, which is shown here, um, yeah, we need, for example, the initial positions of both vehicles. Um, the initial distance is given by the difference, uh, of course, of both positions, then the final position of the ob object vehicle, um, and the lateral change uh, distance, which you can see on the right. Uh, yeah, together with the speed information, then uh, it is possible to reproduce the scenario. Um, maybe you ask, um, or you have the question why um, the, the, the end position of the ego vehicle is not given. Uh, the reason for this is, of course, because we, we need to test this scenario and, um, yeah, we, we um, try to get the, the ego vehicle in a special situation. And then, of course, it has to um, yeah, drive on its own and we, we, we want to see what, what's happened then. Uh, yeah, on the next slide, um, you can see the parameter distribution and, score and uh, correlations. So what we did is we um, uh, took all the parameters, um, uh, yes, and, and, and analyzed them. So we have um, the the distributions, we, which you can see from in this line from the um, <clears throat> from the left top to the uh, right bottom, and uh, the other the other graphs are the um, the correlations between all the the different um, parameters. And with this, we can do um, yeah the the uh, the tests, and we can try to change uh, little things uh, depending on the correlations between uh, the parameters. And maybe a short question here, which yeah. for the, maybe the ones who are not familiar with the correlations, which ones of these fields are most interesting than for your research now? Uh, you can't say that they are uh, specific that are very interesting because it depends on what you are want to test. So if you if you change if you want to change uh, different parameters uh, in a test or in a simulation then you can do this with um, yeah based on on these correlations but it's depending of course of what you what you want to do okay so a correlation that is there is not always good so to say and no correlation is not always bad it depends what you want to want to find out okay yeah so you can you can in a simulation it's the easiest way to to change things um yeah you can you can change maybe the the, the initial position and then you know the correlations to other um to other parameters and can also change them uh, logically you could say okay yeah and the next next step then is um testing uh, these as i mentioned before these uh, scenarios in simulation so what you can see in the video here is um, approximately the same situation you also saw in the real video uh, before. So this is <clears throat> just what we what I what I talked about what we've done. So we try to find the parameters out of it and then uh, reproduce the scenario in a simulation or even on a on a test track. Um, yeah, and what you can what you can also do is then in the simulation you can. Um, Integrate uh, an automated driving system function and uh, and test it in the simulation. 
Yeah, and the other possibility, um, of course, is to test uh, the concrete scenario in the driving simulator. Um, so you also have the parameters from the real data. You can yeah, uh, generate the scenario in the driving simulator, and then you can measure the human performance um, and try to um, compare them. Yes, so I think I'm a little bit faster than I expected. Um, and no uh, problem. Yeah, I want to, want to thank you for your attention. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to, to ask me. Yeah, so please post your questions in the chat and then uh, Jan can read them or I will forward them to him. So I have uh, two, two or three minutes now. Um, while you think, uh, I will just start with some questions. So um, just in the end of your presentation, I wondered, so um, when you make a measurement in the real world and you take the parameters and move them to the simulation to um, yeah, re-enact this in there, so what is the big um, advancement and or the big um, uh, advantage uh, of the simulator um, to move the scenario there? Yeah, so the big advantage is that you can uh, reproduce uh, real real driving data. So what you what you have seen on the on, in, on the roads, you can reproduce in the simulation. So it's not a constructed scenario. So it's a it's a real scenario that has uh, taken place in the traffic. That's a real uh, real advantage of this. Mm -hmm. So we can uh, move realistic scenarios into the simulation to do other things with it like maybe also um, at variations um, yes for example so you can yeah. you can change uh, different parameters in the in the scenario make a, for example um, <clears throat> a vehicle faster or cutting in with a um, with a smaller distance for example or anything else mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay and um, you said earlier that the um, maneuver can be detected by an algorithm that uh, you and Beagle uh, and Beagle developed <laughs> uh, in your institute. Um, uh, I wonder because we were doing similar things uh, in UDrive uh, with the NDS data there and um, we took a lot from video data where we had um, the manual annotation which was needed to train our algorithms to correctly identify the maneuvers. So um, did you also need uh, much of video annotation for this or could you just write down the um, specific uh, edge cases uh, that are detected then? So the question is if we also need the video data. To... Yeah, how, how much manual uh, work you needed to, to uh, train or create the algorithms to look into the data that you had, yeah. Um, I cannot say how, how many it was, but um, <clears throat> normally it should work without video data. The video data we use to uh, yeah, to to validate. So if there were some so data from 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 real traffic, uh, normally is not perfect. So there are mm -hmm. uh, things that yeah that <clears throat> are not so so easy for the algorithm to to detect. And uh, then we need uh, the video to yeah to to validate if the um, if the maneuvers that were found by the algorithms if they if they really happened like. Uh, yeah, the algorithm mm -hmm. detect them. Yeah. Okay. Um, and thank you very much. Um, then you could give the moderator to uh, Peter Wagner. Yes. He will be our next speaker about the optimization of driver and vehicle models based on NDS FOT data for simulation models. So P Peter Wagner studied physics at the University of Mainz and received his doctorate in 1990 on the field of theoretical physics. Since 1996, he has been working at the DLR um, in the Institute of Transportation Systems. In 2006, he moved to Berlin um, to work there in, at the DLR uh, in the same institute. And at the 9th December 2013, he received his professor title in the area dynamic modeling of uh, steering of uh, traffic systems, if I translate it correctly. <laughs> And he is um, also heavily involved in working for the open source project Sumo, Simulation of Urban Mobility. Okay, Peter, yeah. show that, us your talk. <laughs> that sounds good. 
Okay, um, well, you have read the title, um, so I'm going to talk, uh, I, I try to go right in the middle of it. Um, and um, first of all, I would like to present you my idea of what a driver is, um, because um, there are a lot of people that have very, very different ideas about this. And um, I simply would say to state that a driver is a kind of a machine, and this kind of machine that um, receives or that, uh, that recognizes objects that might be on, on such a collision course, as you see here in this, this picture. Um, and from this information, the driver tries to estimate an optimal, or not optimal, a possible action course in order to avoid this, these collisions. Um, and you may see that most of the time the driver is doing absolutely nothing. But, but just following a, a certain course um, it was without any actions um, so far. Um, if he or she has to do something, that, then of course um, he can do that either by changing acceleration or by changing the steering. Um, these are mainly the two things that the that driver in a, in a vehicle can do. Um, so that's, that's basically the idea. And today I will try to concentrate on acceleration only. And you might see this from this video here, from, from this picture here, where you see that very often driving is just following um, along lines. And um, though it, they, there, there might be some lane changing in it, but then, that, then again, you have this car following situation. So in a, in a certain sense, I would like to throw away right now the steering part and just talk about the acceleration part. And of course, just to be clear, acceleration means positive as well as negative acceleration. That means braking as well as what people usually understand when they talk about acceleration. Um, but in physics, acceleration is both positive as well as negative. So um, having tried that, um, I have to introduce some some kind of um, yeah, numbers, some symbols. Um, in order to go for the next one, which is what, what I would like to call a map for car following. Um, so, and the basic idea is um, a driver has a lot of information or not a lot of information, information about neighboring vehicles. And in, in this car following situation, this is of course, the distance to the vehicle in front, which is um, what I usually name gap um, with the letter G for it, G as a function of time, of course, because um, drivers, do react in any moment in time, so to speak. Um, then of course they have their own speed and to certain approximations, they also need know the speed difference to the vehicle in front. And this is, I would say 90 or 95% of all the information that the driver has um, in order to do this car following um, task. Well, it converts these numbers into an acceleration. Again, maybe positive as well as negative. Um, but yeah, this, yeah, that, that, that is kind of map, so to speak. And, um, you can write down a kind of equation for that is, and that, that is what is, what is, what is written down here. Um, the acceleration is a function of these input variables. Um, and this describes what the driver is doing. As you can see here from this um, screenshot from Transportation Research Part F, not everybody is convinced that, um, well, is car following the real question? Are equations the answer? Um, but it is def definitely my belief um, that we need to find the, the good, good equations in order to understand what drivers are doing. So that, that is, so to speak, um, set, setting the, the basics. Um, you might know that there have been a huge number of um, those maps um, that have been proposed over the years, starting from 1950, almost 70 years ago, with with, with first 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 work on this. Um, and well, but still, nobody is um, really happy with all these models. Um, so, um, well, there are a lot of them. They are very simple ones, they are very complicated ones, um, but we do not have the right one right now. At least that's, that's what, what I have um, so far observed. Um, I will work here with one of those that, that is quite easy to understand um, because then you can, can do very simple things with it. Well, 
again, what, what does that driving machine want? Um, it wants to keep a preferred distance. Um, and again, we will see that in a moment, um, not everybody is convinced that this is exactly what, what the driver does. Um, but nevertheless, you are learning this in driving school um, that you should keep um, something like two seconds of preferred time headway to the vehicle in front. And um, of course, this time headway is related to, with the real distance by this simple equation that, uh, that tells you, okay, the distance is just the speed times this time headway. Um, that, that is one point. And of course, the second point is, um, if the driver managed to keep the speed dif difference at zero, um, then the distance to the vehicle, vehicle in front does not change. And um, so this is in a certain sense um, what a driving machine is trying to achieve. Um, it, it is, so to speak, it's, it's Garden of Eden state. That your distance is close or exactly equal to the preferred distance and um, the speed difference to the vehicle in front is zero. Then you're happy, then, then there's no need for further action. Okay, now let's have a look at real data. Um, these are from some NDS um, in a certain sense. Well, and um, you see these points are just data and here is plotted speed versus gap. Um, I have drawn a few curves or a few lines into it. When, for instance, if you look at the dash line, this is just um, with a time headway of two seconds. Um, and the solid line is a robust fit to these data. Um, and you do not really see that, that they are happy with just one distance in a certain sense, absolutely not. Um, and, and of course, this strong scatter um, is very, very typical for all of these data. I have never seen something else, um, something different than, uh, than this, this big, big scatter. So you may say, um, well, drivers seem to tend to a certain preferred gap, well, but not very strongly. It's not that important. Of course, it's a, it's not a good idea to have um, to plot all these data together. It's much better to to switch into something that may be called a probability density in these these data. This is a very very much the same data as before, but now um, they are plotted in a different way. And now you see a little bit clearer that there are some places um, where the driver would like to be. Um, you also see along the speed axis that there are some inhomogeneities um, that you clearly see see that um, this driving has um, taken place a lot in cities, and um, then there was some some trip on the on the highway. Um, in addition to that, I have filtered the data very strongly, um, but it does not change the picture pretty much. Um, so I have looked at especially places or at especially a data where the acceleration was small and the speed difference was small too. Um, and though you may see some tendency um, that the drivers like some preferred distance, but again, it is not very strong. It is a little bit better if you look at, um, at this density plot, which, which plots um, gap versus um, speed difference. Um, there, in fact, you see that drivers seem to prefer the state he, here with, with very small speed differences when, when they are in car following mode. Um, just a very short look on, on the data behind. Um, in this case, they, they stem from a German project named SimTD. Um, this was not designed as an NDS. It was more um, a test for a X communication um, platform. And they had about 100 vehicles, 1,000 drivers, and they were traveling around for three months in, in autumn 2012 um, in Germany. And of course, they, they had this, the standard devices on board that measure the position, the speed, the distance and speed difference, the lead car. But they, they didn't, these were quite normal cars, cars not specially equipped. Um, some cars have it and some cars don't have it. Um, they measure acceleration and the gas and brake, brake pedal um, engagement, so to speak. Um, but again, not, not for all of those cars. And of course, they, they have all the communication data, but of course, I have not used them. So I promised you, so to speak, um, to start with a very simple model. And um, this is so-called Halley's model. Um, and this model is, has, has a big advantage that, that in addition, it serves as a simple AICC, that means an Adaptive Intelligent Cruise Control model. 
again, the idea is um, the driver would like to keep this preferred distance. Um, and of course, if this condition that uh, your real, your actual current distance is larger than the preferred distance, um, that means that you are far away, then you should accelerate in order. That means acceleration should be positive in, in order to, to, um, to come closer to your preferred distance. Clearly, if you are exactly equal to this, um, to this um, preferred distance, then your acceleration is zero. And if you are too close, that means if, if your distance is smaller than the preferred one, you should decelerate um, in order to, um, to increase the distance again. So that's it, that, that is one part. So you might write down this as something like that. Acceleration is some constant um, multiplied with the difference between your preferred speed and your actual, uh, the preferred distance and your actual distance. Um, and of course you have um, these parameters C1 that, that scales the difference um, so that you get the correct units out of this. This is one part and the second part, um, I, I told you that they also would like to have um, speed difference close to zero. Um, and there he, again, you can make do, do the same. If speed difference is positive, that means if the, the car in front is faster than you, it, it might be a good idea to accelerate in order to keep, keep on. Um, if delta V is equal to zero, then you'd have to do nothing. Um, and if delta V is negative, then they are approaching, then maybe it might be a good idea to decelerate. Well, this is again the second equation. Again, the same, same trick. This parameter C2 scales the speed difference and um, it corrects the units. And so you finally end up with, with Halley's model, which is from 1960. Um, so it's quite old already. Um, you just add these two. Um, Again, you can have much more complicated models. Um, and this model here has just three parameters, which is very fun, very nice. Um, so you can work very, very easy with, with it. Of course, it ignores a lot of things. Um, it has nothing about perception and driver's internal states. Um, there, you might even find some contradictions to the data. For instance, there's no minimum or maximum acceleration. Um, it assumes that driver is controlling the driving machine continuously in any milliseconds, um, while true drivers have some kind of discrete control mechanism I will show you in, in a second, and so on and so on. Um, but of course, the interesting point, if, if look into data, um, can you really see these contradictions? And that might be the interesting point. So let us try to test this model. And that, that is what we were finally heading for. Um, so we have a model, we have data, we have this heli model, which has just three parameters. So let us fit it. And interestingly, and that of course is the reason, one of the reasons why I have picked this model, um, this is very simple um, because you have just to do a linear regression between these um, dependent, depend, dependent variable which is the acceleration and the independent variable, which is the distance, speed, and speed difference. Um, and this is what you, exactly what you have in NDS data. Um, so for each time step, um, you have this set of data that means the distance, um, speed, and speed difference. Um, and from that, you compute, so to speak, the acceleration, you measure the acceleration as well. And that means that you can just do um, a linear model with these parameters. Well, I've done that many, many, many times. Um, and I give you just a very short example. This is one car following episode with, which was exceptionally long, 10 minutes. Um, therefore, we have about 6,000 data points um, for, for this car following. And um, if you do this linear fit here, you see um, some numbers for the parameters of this model. Um, and can compute, for instance, this T0, um, which is 1.2 seconds which is quite a reasonable number. So it seems that this fit is quite okay in a certain sense. If you look at the um, statistics of this fit, you see it, or you see even that that is quite strong statistically. Um, though, though of course the interesting question is what does it mean? And so let have, let's have a look at it. Um, how does this, um, well, translate into, um, yeah, a really re real model and there you see, the green is the acceleration data 
and red is the acceleration model. And you see um, that a model is in a certain sense a damped version of, of what the driver is, is doing in reality. Um, so these model behaves much better in a certain sense than the real driver does. Um, and if you look at the, speed, at the, the, the um, distances between the vehicles and you see that um, there is quite some difference between this model and the data, despite the fact that the statistics of the fit is really, really well. So um, it's missing something. Well, there are a lot of ex explanations to it. Um, for instance, the model is wrong. Um, we have not included the right stochasticity. Um, there is this, this issue discrete versus continuous control, control. But if you look back on, on the data plot, do you really see it? Um, in order to see that, you have to look much closer on the data. And then you see, in fact, if you look here at the speed trace of, of one vehicle, um, you might see that there is um, some jumping between, well, acceleration, then do nothing, acceleration again, deceleration. Yeah, you see this discrete action is there. Um, but the interesting question, is it really important? Um, and of course, and this is um, so to speak the, the final point I would like to make, uh, you may assume that the parameters that we have, have um, assumed to be constant are not constant. And in a certain sense, this is our one of our current research topic. Um, these parameters, they vary a lot. Um, and this, you can see that in, if you divide this data set into pieces, um, this is a blue line here. They are they, the red and the green are the same same points as before. And then you see um, the blue line gets better because um, I have four individual fits, and this is not that surprising. Um, but but of course um, you can can see um, that you can estimate the function of the parameters, how, how the parameters change in time from from such from, from this, this approach. Um, well, this might, again might be a very different different story about where, where it does come from, um, but uh, there's definitely no time, not enough time in order to go into these details. So I skip that um, in a certain sense that that's what in a nutshell what I would like to, to talk about. Um, we have models with parameters, we have NDS data, we have an error measure, um, well, this is, a, of course, of course, a very, very long star, uh, story in addition. And we fit the model to, to the data in order to get the, 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 the error matrix. Um, there are other things um, to at least to be mentioned um, in this case. And that, that was the reason why I picked this model. The fitting was linear model. Um, but in most cases, it is, of course, a nonlinear function, um, and so on and so on. So we have run this for many, many, many kinds of tests with all kinds of data, um, with many different car falling models and many different measures of er errors. And the interesting point is that all these models are not that um, different um, when it comes to the comparison with the data. And um, I just give you here one, one of our, our more recent examples where we have 10 different models um, and you see the error in the gap is typically between five and 10, 10 meters, while the error in the speed is typically around one po between 0 0.5 and one meter per second. Um, Peter, so, can, yes? can you wrap it up in, in one minute? Yep. Thanks. I'm there. <laughs> ah, perfect. <laughs> um, so um, the, these NDS are definitely a wonderful source of data for developing better models. I've not talked about this test and compare existing driver models and to calibrate and optimize um, existing existing driver models. And the other point is uh, definitely be careful with validation because um, of course you can validate also the models from the NDS data, um, but this does not mean that, that, that the, the validation that you have done with these data is also valid, so to speak, um, for the, the situation you are looking at. And I think that's it. Thanks for listening. Sorry for taking too long. <laughs> no problem. Thank you very much. Um, so to everyone listening, please post the questions in the chat right now. Um, I just will give you a second and start with the first question. So you showed us how to create simple models from uh, data. And um, 
I wonder, are these uh, simple models actually enough to create a convincing simulation? So for example, when you use these models, I guess, in Sumo to create the behavior also for the uh, simulated vehicles, um, mm -hmm. is the simplification then still enough to um, be used? No, this, this model is too simple. Um, for instance, it is not crash free. This, this, this is one, one, of the, um, one of the issues with it, um, but it serves a, a, as quite nice testing case um, because you can do almost anything with it. Mm -hmm. and, it and of course, um, it is, can be understood, but that, that's another, another long story um, as a kind of approximation to a more complicated model because it's just okay. a linear approximation of something, something more complicated. Yeah, okay. Um, I don't see a new question yet, but I have one that was coming up during your talk. I'm not quite sure if it's uh, still to your talk or maybe um, directed at uh, Jan. It was if the uh, vehicle no vehicle dynamic limits are stressed in these scenarios. So I think it was probably for Jan. These scenarios are capturing maneuvers and scene configurations but it would be difficult to test the limits of the perception system, the dynamic control of the vehicle. Um, so uh, maybe Jan, um, I, are you um, agreeing with me that this is for you? Didn't you uh, use vehicle dynamic could, limits? Yeah. Could be for me, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So if we have, um, so what we are doing with data with um, a, high, a high speed, so over 130, um we we don't um yeah use them for for scenario identification because um our prediction is that the um yeah that automated driving systems will not um uh, deal with uh, speeds over 130 kilometers per hour so okay. uh, we guess that those scenarios are not realistic for for uh, automated driving systems okay good thanks then, um, Jan, uh, Peter, please give the moderator to mm -hmm. Willi, um, and she okay. will continue with our next talk about field observations of driver-driver coexistence for designing cooperative interactions. Um, she holds a medical mechanical engineer degree with excellence from the National Technical University of Athens from 1991, and a PhD on cognitive ergonomics from the same institute from 2015. She has worked in the industrial field, um, designing and developing uh, prototype systems. She has worked as a research consultant in various consultancy companies and in the Hellenic Institute of uh, Transport in the Research Center in Technology in Hellas. And since 2010, she works as a senior researcher in the iSense group of ICCS. So really, now it's your turn. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to all. Um, I will speak about uh, some observations, uh, as I already said, uh, of uh, interactions between drivers. Um, okay. So, uh, what is the background for this work? Uh, as we all know, uh, uh, Driving is not a, a single, is not a, an activity by itself. Uh, we, are, we do not drive alone. Oh, I'm sorry, something happens. I will show it like this. Um, okay, I'm really sorry about this. Oops. Uh, yeah. Can you continue the? Yes, oh, yes, yeah, I will okay. do it like this. I'm sorry, but some, something happens with the animation. Uh, so, uh, the, um, uh, we do not drive alone on the roads, but uh, drivers must uh, coordinate their uh, action with other drivers and with other road users. Uh, so, uh, from previous experience, we see that uh, the, this communication of intent and also the anticipation of the intent of other road users is an essential component of driving and it is really necessary for uh, the safety and the efficiency of the traffic flow. Uh, currently, uh, a prediction of trajectory of the ego vehicle and of the other vehicles is based on uh, physics laws, uh, but uh, 
trying such uh, algorithms and such uh, prediction uh, algorithms uh, has shown to us that uh, uh, the warnings generated are not uh, normally are not typically accepted by the drivers because they believe that this, these predictions uh, do not uh, coincide with their own estimations. Uh, uh, in one step forward, uh, when uh, planning uh, the control and the driving uh, maneuver of an automated vehicle uh, at, uh, an, at a higher level of automation, uh, the automated vehicle should interact with the other road users and uh, this interaction should be in accordance to the expectations of the human road users. But to do so, we must first of all understand how drivers interact now, human drivers interact, and this is uh, currently uh, not studied in very much detail. Uh, Previously, uh, in, the, in the past, we have done some observations of interactions as regards lane changes. Um, so we had 25 drivers uh, who were driving their own vehicle for around uh, 20 minutes to half an hour. Uh, this was a two-way road with two lanes per, per direction, normally high speeds something like 60 to 80 kilometers per hour. And uh, we asked, uh, we were videotaping uh, the traffic scene in front of the vehicle and uh, backwards. And pa in parallel, we asked the drivers to comment aloud uh, how they made the, uh, the thinking, how they reached decisions. Uh, the objective here was to, to capture exactly how drivers communicated their intent relevant to lane changes, how they anticipated the intent of others, how they understood Stood, let's say that uh, somebody was planning to change lane and uh, how they reached the uh, decisions. Uh, we observed 68 interactions relevant to, to lane changes either uh, when our driver wanted to start a lane change or when another driver wanted to start a lane change. I don't go into much detail here because uh, we are a bit uh, short of time. Uh, but what is important is that uh, when uh, analyzing the commentary and the video observations, uh, we see that only in 13 cases we had explicit communication. Uh, this was a use of uh, direction lights or even gestures. Uh, the majority of the cases, how drivers understood that somebody, another driver would uh, change a lane uh, were implicit cues. Uh, for example, when the driver said, uh, ah, this driver that is approaching me uh, is driving very quickly, uh, then uh, th I understand that he or she will change lane. So we have a lot of implicit cues, 43 cases of implicit cues, uh, driving at speed different than the flow, uh, unjustified speed change, close following of the lead vehicle, uh, driving close to the lane marking, not in the center of the lane. Uh, also, we had some small, a ca uh, few cases of cues from the environment. This, this means that uh, I know that uh, this lane, the right lane, merges. So I expect that this vehicle that drives in the, in the right lane now will cut in in front of me. And also, we had some stereotypes. Uh, building on these observations, we tried to build a, a model how drivers uh, declare their intent, announce their intent, and wait uh, for a response by the other driver before proceeding the maneuver. So this is one uh, model that we have built, uh, and it is relevant not only to lane changes, but also to other maneuvers. And uh, now, uh, within uh, the, um, the Interact um, project uh, that is uh, now running, uh, we had a similar experiment, but uh, this time uh, focusing on urban environment and uh, trying to capture interactions relevant to turn, turning. So we had 21 experienced drivers wearing uh, an eyeglass mounted gaze sensor, and this was uh, recording the scene in front and in the back, and also um, uh, the, the trip length was about uh, 20, 18 minutes. And we asked the drivers after the end of the, of the trip to watch uh, some selected parts of the gaze recording, video gaze recording, and comment aloud how they made the decision and what they were paying attention to for each case of interaction. Uh, here, you, uh, here you can see the pictures. Uh, we have the captured the interactions relevant to uh, left turn. You see on the top uh, right picture, we have the, our driver wants to turn left and there is oncoming traffic, uh, dense traffic, so the driver has somehow to coordinate 
co communicate with the oncoming driver. And in the bottom uh, right picture, you can see our driver wants to turn uh, right, and there are also vehicles coming from the left. Again, the driver most of the times has to wait because the traffic is dense, has to wait and somehow reach an agreement, somebody should let uh, the driver uh, turn. Um, how, okay, we had to have a definition when there is a start of the interaction. So the interaction starts when the participant has to wait for a gap or uh, the participant starts turning, expecting that the oncoming driver has to break. So this is also an interaction. Uh, this is the number of, of interactions we have observed. So you see that uh, we had a lot of interactions. Uh, com if you compare the number of interactions with the number of turns, you see that because of the density of the traffic, there were a lot of interactions observed uh, in, for the maneuvers. And then we tried uh, to, uh, decompo to uh, annotate uh, uh, the videos and the commentaries in parallel and see uh, which signals, cues uh, are observed in each interaction. And uh, for example, here you see the diagram that we have uh, prepared for left turn and uh, you see that normally the driver stops and uh, then uh, also the other driver either stops, in which case our driver can can turn if the other driver does not stop and time passes then the, our driver has to edge a bit forward this means uh, moving the vehicle a bit forward and uh, then at some time the other driver decelerates or stops and then our our driver can uh, can turn uh, similarly we have a similar uh, sequences uh, diagrams for right turns here it is more more complicated ah, okay. but again in the, in the wider uh, 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 lines, you can see uh, the uh, signals or cues that you have seen most frequently. In the circles, you have the number of occurrences of each action. Uh, so, uh, in conclusion, edging uh, seems to be effective because uh, after edging, normally the other driver would break to allow our driver to turn. While the drive, if only the turn indicator was used, this was not so effective. This means that our driver could wait for long with only the turn indicator. Uh, instead, if the driver used edging, then this was more efficient. Um, so, as, uh, because of the specific traffic environment, when the other driver uh, used uh, the headlight, uh, this was this could either mean that yes, please. Uh, uh, turn or no, don't turn. So this interpretation was done complementary to the other drivers, to the other vehicles dynamics. Uh, of course, acceleration of the other driver and use of horn was interpreted as not intention to yield. And also we have seen other cues which are also relevant, for example, for a perception uh, system. Uh, for example, people waiting at the bus stop, this means that the bus will stop. So this means I can turn. Uh, as regards the commentaries, uh, eye contact, achieving eye contact with the other driver, uh, our driver said that this is a very good means uh, to con convince the other driver to help. Wha uh, on the contrary, when the other driver intentionally avoided eye contact, uh, this was interpreted, ah, he will not uh, help for me. Edging was used intentionally and it is very effective, as I have said. Uh, use of, of headlights was a means to attract the attention of the other driver in case time passed. Um, and uh, we, can, we, we, we can conclude that our drivers uh, monitor uh, the attention, the focus of the other driver. Uh, so uh, if they understood that the other driver has perceived them, then maybe they could initiate turning although the other driver has not started had not started braking so they monitor uh, where the other driver focuses attention and also the time that passes by makes our drivers uh, more uh, um, willing to accept uh, shorter distances to turn to turn and as i said they take advantages of external events for example people waiting at the bus the bus will stop I'm, uh, in conclusion, uh, I have said all of these uh, things. Uh, what all of these things mean for an automated vehicle? Maybe an automated vehicle that wants to turn should consider edging. Uh, else it might wait for long, at least in circumstances of dense traffic.
direct communication to other drivers at low speeds may be main, main beneficial. Uh, also, drivers do not always respect safety distances. We have seen several cases where our drivers started turning, although the other driver, the oncoming driver, had not started decelerating. And uh, an explicit signal uh, to inform about the yielding by the automated vehicle may be also beneficial. As regards the method itself, the running commentary is appropriate for simple environments to capture the driver's thinking, but for complex urban environments, this is rather not appropriate, as we have seen in our second experience, experiment, because it's so complicated that the driver cannot at the same time drive and speak aloud. So at this case, in complex environment, we have used uh, the offline commentary. This I, is I'm it. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm perfect. Perfect. Okay, <laughs> You're very hurrying in the end, um, but I okay. think there was very much uh, good material in there. I wonder if the automation uh, uh, programming engineers are taking hints from your talk, because there are a lot of uh, cues uh, that seems to be rather relevant. Maybe one question in the end. Um, yeah, uh, one question from, from me. Um, do you think that the uh, implicit cues are actually more relevant than the explicit cues? Oh. Uh, okay, so uh, in our opinion, uh, are as important as explicit cues. So uh, mm -hmm. also it is how, of course, uh, uh, this may be dependent on the on the traffic environment of the country, but in, in our opinion and according to our observations, they are as important as explicit cues. Okay, good. And since we're running out of time, can you give the presentation back to me? I sure. would ask the uh, participants um, to ask further questions by email and we then come back to you um, after the webinar. So just uh, to close it up, uh, I want to uh, uh, um, direct your attention to the next uh, webinar in our CAD series. It will be on the 6th of September um, in the uh, series number 11, the level three pilot project and methodology for piloting automated driving and European roads. You can also get involved in our Cadre uh, project um, over um, our newsletter or becoming a partner. You can all see the um, links here on the last slide. You will also be able to download the slides later. Thank you very much for attending. Um, thank the speakers uh, for being here today and enlightening us. Um, yeah, this is it. And thanks for attending everyone. Goodbye. <laughs> okay, bye. Bye. Thank you.